uh, this is like another installment of C. I do be listening. <laughs> um, I'd like to be joined today by with the with the, the dope, amazing like Andre Rochester. Um, funny story, hilarious story. Um, <laughs> we went to high. So funny, I'm, I'm laughing before I say it. Um, we went to high school together. Like we went to high school together, um, and it's just weird because like we didn't really connect. Like. I think I may have seen you every one, just once mm-hmm. in a while. I'm not really sure. Like, just like, but I was also I worked in the school store, so. Um, but like, um, but we didn't really connect until like what, what ten years later. Like, just longer just, than that. Yeah, like so. <laughs> so like we were like, and 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 I'm just gonna be real with you. Like in the time since we've met, like you've been just one of the most like stand up dudes I've met. It's just like it's, it's not guessing you up because you're here. It's just like it's, it is what it is, right? So I'm joined by. Um, Entrepreneur, artist extraordinaire, mentor, curator, just again, super dope person, Andre Rochester. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the studio, man. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's really funny that we didn't meet. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, I, I don't know how the hell we didn't meet. Um, it, it wasn't that big. Like, no, it, was, <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> like, but uh, I'm, I am glad that we did connect uh, because we do uh, we, we share a lot of interests and uh, we have a lot of mutual friends, which uh, I think it was only inevitable that it would happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm glad uh, we met under the circumstances that we did because I got a chance to see you as the stand-up person that I know you are, and um, you know just working with the community and hearing about the things that you're doing, even with uh, with your job and stuff like that. Like that's that's really cool, man. Mm-hmm. And I admire the work that you're doing. It's mutual. Thank you. It's very mutual. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, we're just going to get into it for a little bit. Again, I, I just wanted to pick his brain, same thing that we did with the first episode. Because um, again, I'm a fan of process conversations. I want people to figure out. I just want to know how people do things because I think it's like it's, it's just necessary to do that because I just don't think we do this enough, right? So um, as usual, my first question isn't mine. Okay. Um, it comes from BuzzFeed's Another Round. It's, it's a, from the, from their podcast. It's okay. an amazing introductory question. I just think it's the best. So, um, what do you do and why? Okay. Um, well, there's there's two parts of what I do. So, I'm an artist. Um, first and foremost, I identify myself as an artist. Um, I also work in corporate America. Um, I mention my job because everything's all intertwined. It's all relative. Mm-hmm. Um, as an artist, it's my goal, of course, to make a living off of what I do, to be able to live comfortably, uh, take care of my future family, and so on and so forth. Um, but ironically, I had to kind of stray from that path of being a full-time artist mm-hmm. to get ahead to where I am right now. Um, I work in corporate America, and I use my salary to, of course, pay my bills, but on top of that, I was able to uh, rent studio space um, and, and host different shows for other artists yep. and things. And so I was able to afford to do the things that I want to do to give back mm-hmm. that I wasn't necessarily ready to do at that time as an artist, as just a working artist. Okay. So, um, you know, I continue to work and uh, I have no problem with it because I'm able to make my job work for me. Okay. Um, the other part of what I do besides making art. Um, as an artist, I, I like to call myself now an artist advocate. Um, I, I've been working with artists in the community um, to kind of identify and address certain needs that we have that I, I don't think that are being um, properly addressed at the time. Mm-hmm. Well, at this time, rather. Um, I work with other artists uh, really just to get people to collaborate more, to work together. Um, in our community, there's a lot of silos. A lot of different movements happening, and we don't all know each other. Uh, we don't all know that we're doing what we're doing, yeah, right? Sure. Um, and so I, I see an opportunity now to basically connect people together, build that network that's necessary for us to thrive and flourish and, and be the artists we know that we are. Mm-hmm. And it's cool that I love that you say that also because again, like what I realized, just in the, in, in the community, like just in, in Hartford and Greater Hartford mm-hmm. communities, it's like it seems to be a place where you need to know people, right? So you, yeah. so you see, like. The, the infrastructure isn't set up in a way where we could all be a part of everybody's stuff or that we would even know how to, to where to start with that. So again, um, I will go to events all the time, but again, it'll be the events of like people I know, it'll be the mm-hmm. small circle I know. So again, yeah. if I'm the, because t- the majority of my circle comes from like Tapas fam, shout out to Self Suffice, everybody else from that mm-hmm. tree. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, because like, 
that was an incubator of talent. And again, like that mm-hmm. kind of like put me onto a lot of people that are like running things right now, which is cool. And I've said this a lot, and it's like no disrespect to those guys, but like I want to meet other people. I want to see what other people are doing. I want new thoughts. I want. I want. I just always want to encounter like new thoughts, new yeah, traditions, new there's, ways there's doing stuff. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Like, mm-hmm. That's a that's a perfect example of uh, an opportunity where people can meet each other. Yeah. Um, but even within that group, you have this circle of people who are always going to support one another because they're familiar with one another. Exactly. Um, and then you have the other circles that they deal with, right? Mm-hmm. Except the thing is, what people do out here is they'll have this circle over here which serves one purpose, they have this circle over here which serves another. Okay. But they don't ever... They never meet. think about combining. They too. never combine. And that's, yeah. that's the problem right there. Yeah. Right? So, um, I like to go out and work with people I've never worked with before. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like to reach out to people who I don't know on purpose mm-hmm. and, and do stuff with them. Um, if I know you, that doesn't mean I'm not going to work with you. <laughs> I don't want that to, to come off that way. But, um, you know, there, there's something in building those new relationships with people. Yeah. Uh, getting that bond, uh, building that 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 working relationship with someone so, so that down the line you can introduce them to someone. Yeah, like I like who oh, you know who they um, can benefit from. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I'm I'm famous for saying that like I like being the plug as far as like so yeah. I like knowing what people do and knowing what people want to do and mm-hmm. I just I like to know what people want to do so I can connect people to people who can help them do it. Gotcha. Like so again I'm I'm a fan of that as well and again like it's just it's I don't want to say that things are stagnant mm-hmm. but I really love like being in some of the rooms that like because again, like full disclosure, I'm a part of like some of the groups that you're speaking about. So mm-hmm. like, it's cool to be in some of those rooms and see people who like and get perspectives from people I've never, I've never, mm-hmm. I, I just never met before, and like see how amazingly talented they are and how they rock, like and just knowing that like from that will come opportunities. Mm-hmm. So like that's amazing to me. But again, just generally like how I know you speak as far you spoke as far as like just being able to like just to. To, to mentor and like, but again, like, what else, what does it do for you on like either part? Like, cause we, we kind of, we brush on the why a little bit, but I just want to know like a little bit, is there anything else you can add to that? I, I think that as we move ahead, no matter what we do, mm-hmm. doesn't matter if you're in corporate America, it doesn't matter if you're an artist, doesn't matter if you're a musician, whatever, whatever. As you move ahead, it is your duty. It is your obligation to reach back and help somebody along the way. Mm-hmm. Because you need the help to get where you are. I don't care if the biggest accomplishment I have ever in life is to own a home. And that's all I got to, to say for myself. And as far as my arts and, and everything is this is going. Um, but if I don't at least open my home up to somebody in a way where it may benefit them, then I've done an injustice because I didn't use my means to help somebody. So that could be using my man cave for a group to meet every now and then, right? Mm -hmm. That could be using the fact that I'm a homeowner and uh, I've learned that process, right? Yeah. And sharing it with somebody. That doesn't always mean I gotta have a million people at my house. <laughs> it sure but doesn't. Let them know. The, the experience, <laughs> right? The experience that you have in order to get to a certain place. If you don't share that with somebody, then what the hell did you do it for? Mm-hmm. It's not worth anything unless you can share it. Side note, it also means like inviting us into his house to like shoot. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, so um, but yeah, like definitely we appreciate that too. So, um, What's your artistic origin story? My artistic origin is, uh, actually, I was about seven years old. My dad bought me my first sketchbook. And uh, you know, I, I joke around with everybody. I say, really, it's just to shut me up and keep me occupied. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sure there are other benefits to that, too. <laughs> exactly, exactly, right? So um, needless to say, I took it and ran with it, and I just kept drawing and kept drawing. And there were more sketchbooks and more sketchbooks. Mm-hmm. And I just kept pursuing it. Um, but the uh, most important part about my story, at least from where my artist origin is, is that I went through a lot as a kid, and it was art that helped me get through it. Uh, my mother had multiple sclerosis, 
from when I was 10 years old up until she passed away when I was 16. Okay. I had to take care of my mother. I had no outlets. I was by myself. I didn't have much in forms uh, in form of emotional support. Um, so I had a sketchbook. And had it not been for me doing my drawings and stuff and, and really learning that skill and, and putting time into that, I would probably be going down a different path than what I am right now. Okay. Um, that is the number one reason why I'm an artist today. Had it not been from, uh, from that experience with my mother and, and literally having to grow up quickly, become a, I, I would like to say, become a man early, <laughs> um, I would probably not be taking art seriously. Now, the benefits of me putting that time in, of course, is that I got good responses in school. And, you know, I, I, was the, I was the kid who passed all the art classes and didn't do so well in math and science. Yeah. <laughs> but, hey, it worked, worked out, out for me. Yeah. It worked out for me. Um, I got really good responses during high school. And, uh, you know, people really seemed to latch on to my work. So I decided, you know what? I love doing this. I'm going to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got involved in some after school programs and I got involved with uh, some mural projects where I was able to work with professional artists and learn the process of, of actually develop, developing a, a real solid piece from start to finish that would be public. And uh, I did one for, uh, it was an immigration center in downtown Hartford, yeah. uh, which unfortunately it's, uh, it's been taken down. Uh, since, but this is, we're talking like yeah, was 15 like old, years yeah. ago, so should I not uh, take a year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, we'll, we'll say it was junior year high school. Mm, okay. did it. Uh, the other mural was for uh, Catholic Charities in, uh, in one of their locations in mm -hmm. Hartford, and I got a chance to work with uh, a, a very, very uh, highly respected artist uh, in the area. Um, those experiences taught me that being creative and being an artist is okay because I can I can take this and do something with it. Mm -hmm. And so from there, I decided that I was going to go to school. Um, I started off as a graphic design major. Uh, that quickly changed. Uh, I just didn't want to sit in front of a computer. It just wasn't. Uh, it wasn't you from the field. Yeah, I like I like to feel my heart. You know, mm -hmm. I, I like to get my hands dirty. Um, I want to. It, I want to do something in that process, you know, not just sit in front of the screen yeah. and, and click a mouse. That's not to say that there's no creativity in graphic design. Mm -hmm. There certainly is. Um, but I just, I needed that physical aspect of it more so than the mental part of creating the work. Mm -hmm. So I chose illustration where I could take that graphic design background and I can, um, I can apply it to a more, uh, a more physical tangible uh, form of art. Like I can get that in like a lower scale sense because again, I'm a writer and like nothing does it for me more than pattern paper. Mm -hmm. Like pattern paper just, 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 just cause again, I get tired because like, my stuff doesn't get to the computer to like way uh, to it's done. Mm -hmm. um, so I get that too as far as like wanting to feel your work and just yeah. feel real. Um, does art still have the same therapeutic value to you? Always. Okay. Always. It never stops. Art is, art is therapy. It keeps me sane. It keeps me grounded um i'm able to come in the studio and just let go of everything all the stresses of the day and just enjoy myself because i'm doing something that i love yeah and there's nothing more therapeutic than doing something that you love and that you're passionate about you know regardless of whatever it takes for you to be able to do it once you're in that room and you're able to do that task or, or that that craft that you've been working on that you, that you just love mm -hmm. Everything else doesn't bother you. So, you know, when I'm in the studio, that's, that's, that's my happy place. Okay. You know, that's my zone, you know. If we had to quantify it, like, what's the average time spent on... I don't know if this is hard because like, they're different sizes, different canvases. Like, just, what, what, what's your... Just so we can quantify the work being done. Mm. Like, how much time are you, like, locked into the cave? Wow. Um, <laughs> like, like, so, as far as how much time it takes to actually do the work... Yeah. It really varies. Um, mm -hmm. I've done pieces where it took me three months to finish it because uh, I just had other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, I've done pieces where it took me one week. Right. 
Sometimes I work slow. Sometimes I work fast. You know? Sometimes I work slow. Sometimes I like. Yeah. <laughs> I was on one too fast and say, man. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I've done I've done a, a, a seven foot piece recently, which mm. uh, actually took me a week. Okay, took me a good twelve to fifteen hours. Was that yeah. flight? What is, is it? New? Is it new? No, this was uh, this was the piece that I did with the. Uh, it was a backdrop. Uh-huh. For uh, for a lot oh of yeah, I remember. Yeah, yes, yeah, I saw, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. So I did that one, and it was fairly quick. Um, I had a concept going in, and, and I just kind of stuck to what I tried to to keep within the, the set formula that was given to me. So it was requested that I do that subject. So, mm-hmm. um, and I've had small pieces like eighteen by twenty four. Uh, which is nothing, you know, it's a foot and a half by two feet, real, real small, um, that have taken me 40 hours. I mean, but easily. It, but it's also like, it's not like, so I would say the detail on your work is like, the detail on your work is like amazing. So again, like obviously, so like I've seen like, obviously, and, and I'm not saying this to like the diminish it because I've seen some, so I would consider like this to be an abstract, that's just me. Like I, go, so like, like I, like, but I love it that way too. But again, I get, but I've also seen like yeah. so. Even if we're looking at the, it's gonna be hard to do that, right? But even if we're looking at like like you, you do faces in a way, like faces, body, skin, just skin tones and stuff in a way where like, to me, it looks like a photo. Like if I'm if I'm if I'm more than like two feet away, it just looks like. I didn't, I didn't even know they made those colors. Like, <laughs> so it's, like, it's like, but again, like, so it's also like, so, so even though you say it's a small piece, it's like, I, I know you put a lot of work in it because it actually shows. Yeah. One, one thing I can say is uh, with the smaller pieces, it's harder mm-hmm. because now you have to think about what details you're going to omit versus a larger piece where you have free range. Yeah. Do whatever the hell you want to. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and even sometimes that's a challenge because now it's like, okay, what am I doing too much? Yeah. Why, why do I have this space over here covered? Not this space. And you know, you got other challenges that come with working with large work. Um, but with larger pieces, I try to simplify it for that reason. Um, but with the small pieces, you know, you really got to go in there. You have to be meticulous about what you want that piece to look like. Um, start off with an idea, but be willing to let that thing kind of form organically. You know, okay. you want to let the piece do what it's going to do. It's not always going to look like how you planned it at first. Uh-huh. Believe me, none of my pieces have. Okay. Um, <laughs> not one. Not, not right. one. Not one piece. Um, so you, you just kind of let the you let the process happen how however it's going to happen. Um, so you know, again, like I said, you know, it, it can be something where it takes me a week. It can yeah. be something that takes me three months. Yeah. Um, but on average, depending on the subject matter, it can be anywhere from fifteen to fifty hours. Mm-hmm. A good family portrait took me fifty hours. Yeah, I remember That's you all. August. You also did the Wonder Woman one too. Yep. And I was like, that was also like another portrait. Of yeah, that was a challenge. Because <laughs> I remember we were talking about this too, as far as like scaling it down yeah, and trying yeah. to figure out, like you said before, yeah, what yeah. what to omit. Like so again, not being too detailed mm-hmm. where. The, I, you can explain it better. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so there were certain <laughs> with that one, there were certain details uh, with this person that I was given. Mm-hmm. So, which is why I did the Wonder Woman thing. Yeah. Like, obsessed with Wonder Woman mm-hmm. to, to a point where it, it might be a little crazy. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> but we all in, in we case all got she sees this, I don't think you're crazy, but. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, yeah. So the, with the Wonder Woman piece, I had to I had to make it look like Hartford behind her, and yeah. um, I had to make sure that it looked like an authentic version of Wonder Woman, which took a little research because there's a million different exactly. Wonder Woman costumes and stuff out there, and uh, I made it look like the one in the show. Right. So a lot, and that's the thing. Like, so again, you're working with a piece where, like, with any one factor, a lot of yeah. things are going on. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing that that really. Um, was her, uh, you know, physically was, was bust the, up. Yeah, <laughs> the bust up. Everything else was made up from, yeah. from my head. Um, so it, it was a bit of a challenge to do, and uh, you know, I did have to extend my my time a little bit on that uh, because I wanted to get it right. Yeah. Uh, uh, another thing about me is if it ain't right, you ain't seeing it. I respect that. Plain and simple. I don't care when you needed it. <laughs> if it ain't right, you ain't seeing it because. No. I don't want to put anything out there that I'm not proud of. That's a portfolio. Like, I guess. Exactly. Um, exactly. And it's so like, and also like, the, 
what I, what I what I thought was impressive about that piece was just the general was just the general hubris to draw a person, mm. like to paint a person. Like you don't have to so again like like you I'm I do stick figures all day. <laughs> That's what I got. Like, but it, but it, it's just like it's just it's just so again like going back into the time like just the time that you need to spend to get the detail to like take these colors and make someone and replicate somebody's face. Yeah. So with, with portraits and, and just drawing and, and painting people in general, I like the challenge. Mm-hmm. I love it. Um, it. There's no two people that look alike. Even even identical twins have something different about mm-hmm. them. And as the artist, it's my job to find that something different. Uh, so that I can capture not only their likeness but their personality, yeah. so they know who it is. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, I, I actually started off doing abstract. I know you pointed out the piece back here. Yeah. Um, that's that's probably about seven years old now. Still fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the other part of it is in the yeah, other. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, I needed something that was a little different. And so I got into portraiture, um, and I did a, a self-portrait, and it was, uh, it was actually when I had dreads. dreads. Yeah, 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 the one with the clouds and stuff in the mm-hmm. background. So yeah, there's a whole long story about that, about that portrait and, and some of the other stuff that, uh, that I did. Um, but anyway, going back to your question, uh, I, I did the... Uh, that portrait and I moved on to doing people because it was so well received yeah. and that was the first portrait that I had done since my senior project at UConn um, which was about four years prior to that so okay. um, it was just something that, that I, I enjoyed uh, and here I am still doing portraits and figures you yeah. know I just enjoy it man I, I love it Side note, what y'all need to know is that like I only rock with people who I'm a fan of, right? So we're talking. I, I be knowing these pieces, like I'm. Mean, like, <laughs> but yeah, like um, I, you. When did you know you could do this professionally? Um, when that's why I've, I've never told anybody this, but when you find yourself meeting adversity, not just. Not just uh, the challenges that go along with pursuing a dream, but when you find yourself in adversity, people are trying to tell you you can't do it, mm-hmm. and you find yourself not being able to stop doing it. That's when you know you need to do it. Yeah, plain and simple. Okay, my entire time in college was spent with a particular individual who was very close to me, telling me that I should do something other than be an artist. So imagine your entire time in college. All years spent in college. <laughs> Where you're supposed to be figuring you know, out. You were like, supposed to be figuring out what you want to do with your life. And uh, when you're supposed to be pursuing that goal that, that you've set for yourself that, so that you can be a professional in that field that you've chosen for yourself, only to have somebody close to you in every conversation tell you you shouldn't do it and you're not going to make it. But yet, still, there's something in your mind, or something outside, you know, some some higher power, mm-hmm. God, telling you that you have a gift and you need to use it. Okay. So, for me, it's it's about following what what I feel is my calling, and finding a way to do that without uh, without putting myself or my future family at risk. I say future family because I'm engaged, of course, but uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, I want to thank you. I, I want to uh, make sure that no matter what I do, my child, whenever I have a child, sees me working as a professional artist. So I'm going through all these struggles and the challenges now to make sure that that happens. Mm-hmm. Um, so since I've known you, which technically is a short burst of time. Not like, um, that's a, but since I've known you, you've been arguing about like just artistic sustainability. Mm-hmm. Um, just like for a city like Hartford, that's like experiencing a, like a, like gubernatorial support. Um, mm-hmm. People are being fired. Money's being like reallocated. Um, money is also being. We're also being told that money isn't here. Like, um, what steps do you think, as someone who is like 
in a sense, one a mentor, two an art, arts advocate. Like, what, what, what steps do you think need to be made? And that's like from anyone. So, you know, this this is my uh, first steps uh, into into getting into the arts advocacy. So, I, I am by no means an expert in it. However, as an artist, I know what I need. Yeah, I was gonna say like that's like literally that, all you need to tell. Like that's I know what I need <laughs> in like, order to thrive. Right? But that's my thing. Like you being an advocate. You being an artist advocate at the very core is like you being mm-hmm. an advocate for yourself. Exactly. Because again, if you know what you need as an artist, you know what other people need. Exactly. You know. So again, and the, the key to it though is to acknowledge the fact that you know what you need, mm-hmm. and that you don't necessarily know what other what everybody people's needs, needs are, mm-hmm. because there are different types of artists than a visual artist. I know what it's like to be a painter and a certain support that I need as a painter. I don't know what musicians need. I don't know what the theater needs. I don't know what dancers need. These types of things are um, are foreign to me. So it's my job as someone who wants to pursue this to reach out to those people who are in that sector of the arts community and talk to them. Mm-hmm. Find out what it is, right? Have an open mind, have conversations. And not with concept. Exactly. <laughs> right. Common sense, right? right. Um, and just go out there and, and meet people. That's that's the first thing you can do. How you how are you gonna be an advocate for anything or anybody if you don't go and meet the people involved? In? So I mean, it's done. First thing is have the conversation. <laughs> have those conversations. Um, that's you know, it's been working for me so far. Um, I'm confident that you know, over the next year or two, some things are gonna change for the better within uh, the Hartford arts community. And I'm also confident that the artists are going to be the ones to make that change. Because we have to be smart. You know, the funding, unfortunately, it's not there. <laughs> you can't fight for something that ain't there. Yeah. You know, you can't gripe over something that's not available to you. Mm-hmm. It's not available to a lot of different functions within the city. So for us to be mad about it, and not do anything about it to help ourselves is foolish. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. I've always been of the opinion that like art drives culture. Like not, it's not that they're around. So again, like either way, like and, and it's also like, even though we bring up and it's been brought up a lot as far as like the, the gubernatorial like help or whatever, a lot of people here weren't receiving that in the first place. Exactly. I never received any help from from the state. I didn't receive any help from the city mm-hmm. you know, as far as like grants and stuff. I've gone to uh, workshops and, and programs that may have been funded by the city, but I didn't directly receive any money. So, mm-hmm. um, and so I, I've kind of had to figure out how am I going to do this? I'm going to get a grant for whatever reason. So what am I going to do? Yeah, I ain't going to stop painting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll figure that shit out. <laughs> right. So, um, with that with that being said, most of us have day jobs. Okay, Mm -hmm. most of us are required to use a certain skill set within that day job. Mm -hmm. Okay, for me, I work in quality assurance. Right, I used to be an internal auditor at one company. I am now a procedure writer in another. Okay, Um, the skills that are required of me in the workplace, I can apply directly to this situation. Not necessarily what I do as a painter, yeah. but as an advocate, yeah. I can analyze a situation and figure out what's the problem and try to get down to root cause and corrective action. Like, I was going to get to that further too, like, because again, it's just, it's, 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 because again, that's been something you've preached like for a while. Like, like just, just like, so again, a lot of times we see each other as, like, we see each other as artists and like, that's it. Mm-hmm. So like we completely discount the experience of like the job we're working forty hours, fifty hours, sixty yeah. hours. Like, like I said, it's all relative. It's all valuable. You yeah. have to make your job work for you. Now it's that opportunity to make our jobs work for us. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is that we do, if it's retail, then you're in sales, right? Yeah. If you're good at selling stuff, why not sell yourself? Exactly. Yeah. So, but that's the thing. Like, I think there needs to be like some some level of. Um, some level of asset mapping, right? So yeah. as far as because yeah. that's the thing. Like, so again, if we're speaking about like, if we're speaking about um, just just an entire community of people who like who are artists, one, but two, who also have like infinite amounts of skills, whether it be like from places that they work or just stuff that they've majored in. I think that people in our arts community don't realize 
the amount of skills that they have. I, I say this because we don't always think about what we do for a job. Um, like I said, most of them have day jobs, but a lot of us, we may feel that working that day job is just so that we can survive because whatever we're doing out here isn't supported. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens when you use your day job to provide the support? Yeah. Then what happens? But, 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 but also, like you said, too, like not even on a fiscal level, but even like, so even when you use... Like, like we were talking about, like the skill set, like the skill sets that you're using at your job. Because again, a lot of people, and it's funny because it's the same. It's, it's a it's a similar like marriage narrative to the whole like ball and chain scenario where it's like people see a job that's paid. And I'm not saying you gotta love your job because I've I've had a couple of jobs I ain't like at all, but they Most put money in my pocket. Job. But no, but my <laughs> but, but it's also finding the inherent skills yeah. and being able to see like the long view as far as being like, all right, cool. Like, I don't like selling blah, blah, blah mm -hmm. to these people and so on and so forth. But again, to your point, like, how do we, like, there are inherent skills there. So again, because I did sales, I'm a great public speaker. I know that. Like, I do call, I can do cold calls, I do whatever it is, because like, I'm great as far as lobbying for myself. I'm great mm -hmm. as far as, like, just figuring out, one, how to approach people, how to have conversations mm -hmm. with people, how to figure out what you value so I can, like, pitch stuff to you, right? So again... These are inherent skills I got from a job I ain't like. Yeah. So it's like not being wrapped up on the fact that you have a job you don't like, but trying to figure out what you're getting from that job that you may not like. Yeah, I think um, once we realize that, then we'll be able to do workshops and teach people mm -hmm. how to identify those skills that they have and then teach them how to tap into that. Mm -hmm. um, but I really think that Artists need to do a, do a self assessment. SWOT analysis. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> Why not do it? No, you're right. Why not? Um, and, uh, and figure out what it is that you're good at mm -hmm. outside of art. We know you're good at art. You wouldn't be an artist if you weren't good at art. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a given, right? Uh, you wouldn't be performing if you weren't a good musician or if you weren't a good dancer, mm -hmm. relatively speaking. Um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, <laughs> there's something that you have to do outside of that to get by, right? Yeah, Dre just think about you, it. Dre just, just gave y'all homework, like strengths. Yeah, like, like, seriously, seriously like, identify what you like. <laughs> like if, it's, if there's anything you get out of this conversation, it's on you to make it better. <laughs> it ain't on me. It's not on Pat. It's not on everybody else. It's on you because whose situation is it? yours mm -hmm. now it's on all of us collectively to work together to make things better however the first step is internal you identify what you have as a skill set that may be helpful to that cause and you're already artists so you're already existential exactly like you're already existential like art is like art's inherently an existential tool seriously Think like it's, an evaluation, it's an evaluation of self and, and, and circumstance like that's just what that is um, to continue that though you're an artist, you're a mentor, you're a curator. Um, and everything else that you want to tag to that, because I know there's more, right? So um, <laughs> how do these skills align? And how do they feed you on a spiritual level? So I've always, you know, going back to that, to, you know, it being our duty to, to give back and to, to bring people with you. I've always wanted a storefront gallery where I help out up-and-coming artists. I've always wanted that from the beginning. That's, that's what I wanted because... I've been in situations where I was turned down and, and told that, oh, well, I have to know that I'll be able to sell your work in order to show you. Or I only deal with artists that I've dealt with for 20 years, right? I've actually heard these things from people. Now, how am I supposed to get ahead if these are the only people out here? <laughs> it was a 20 year vetting process. Yeah, like, <laughs> seriously, I don't have 20 years. Right? <laughs> um, so. <laughs> So, so what I what I decided is, you know what? Because I've been through that experience, and there are some people who have also gone through that experience, or some people who don't even know how to approach people to do a show. I want to take it upon myself to provide that opportunity. I want to work with people um, to do art shows. Um, of the people that I've curated for over the last six years. There was only one show that I did where it wasn't their first time showing. Okay. So 
out of all these artists, I gave them the opportunity to have their first solo show. Um, it's not about having the prestige of being in a gallery. I wasn't in a gallery. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, some were in my studio, some were in a commercial space that a friend of mine rented. Some were actually in a gallery space. Um, but I was able to provide that to somebody and, and give them the same feeling that I had when I had my first solo show. Mm-hmm. Um, there's nothing like seeing your work on the wall presented in a professional manner and having people come admire it and getting that feedback. You know, not everybody's going to like your work, so don't go thinking that. But um, getting the feedback from your, from the general public, from people you don't know, and having them like your stuff mm-hmm. is different from your family telling you, oh, he's so talented. Yeah. Oh, that's so good, right? That's a completely different experience. It means more when it comes from people you don't know because they're not telling you because they love you. Mm-hmm. They're telling you because they literally like the work. And that's, that's a cool, all they know. And that's the cool thing. Like it's, it's, it's a very necessary like um, rite of passage. Yeah. Like so again, like just, just so you, so one you making it like easier for because because like, again I like, one of my best friends is one of the people that you created you, you who and it was phenomenal to me like how easy you made that process. Yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't make things difficult. Mm-hmm. If I see that you're passionate about what you're doing and that you have drive to actually get somewhere with it, I'm not going to give you a hard time at all. Mm-hmm. I did have one artist, though. <laughs> yeah. There was one artist who, uh, he wasn't confident in his work. And so he kept, he kept kind of prolonging the process of having a show until one day he, uh, he told me that he wasn't sure that he's actually ready to do it and that he wanted to cancel on me. So, <laughs> uh, that situation was a little difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually had to keep pushing with him and keep pushing with him and, and uh, you know, got to a point where I did eventually get angry with him and tell him, look, mate, we'll do this damn show. You ain't gonna waste my time. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, a situation where, like, I was cussing him out or nothing like that. It was like I had to be very stern with this person. Like, we put work in. It, it, it's one of those things where, you know, you know you have a skill, but you don't know you're talented. I see skill. I see that you're talented. And I know for sure that you're going to get great response. Okay. So I want to push for you to do it. So I was gonna say, like, so when it comes, so how do you how do you tackle that? Like, so if we're at a point where again you see it, because that's the thing. Like, I've full disclosure, like I was sitting on a chat book for a minute. Mm-hmm. They're like, and it, like, and, and it's just like, it, and if I'm being real with you, like, obviously I had my supporters and stuff, mm-hmm. but like I was sitting down on it as well. Like, and we we had a conversation in this parking lot. Mm-hmm. I remember that. Like, we had a, like, and I, if I'm being real with you, like that actually helped move the process through far, through faster. So like so so I can speak to being the person or like being in a position where I knew what I had was cool, mm-hmm. but I didn't really know how you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like, like I wasn't. So again, like how do you? Because I know it's not it's not your job to do the counseling or getting people to like see the inherent value of their work, but how do we? It's it's not my job to to get you to see that there's value in what you do. However, if I'm going to, you know, put on a mentor hat and, and curate for you and, and work with you to develop your work, it's, it's my job to let you know that there are more people than you think mm-hmm. who are paying attention to you. The more people than you think that like your work. And that, uh, you know, sometimes getting over that hurdle of uh, you know being shy and, and not wanting to show your work because you you may not be confident in it just yet sometimes it it, it just takes a little little nudge to get you to, to you know be a little more brave <laughs> put your big boy pants on go out there and see what happens now what this person I was talking about didn't know is that I've already shown a whole bunch of people because I like this stuff. <laughs> nice. I like this work. So yeah. I'm already talking so you about got it. That. So when I say you ain't going to waste my time, I mean, you ain't going to waste my time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because I'm investing something in you. 
right? Not to mention, it ain't costing you nothing to do this, right? So, so are you, so you, you may as well. Have, you have a free show. Yeah, you may as well. And you gonna tell me that you ain't ready for it? Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> I guess you know. So, and, and even with that, you know, I wouldn't invest any any money or anything like that into someone, regardless of whether it's a hundred dollars or five hundred dollars. I'm not going to invest anything into you if I don't believe in you, mm-hmm. right? So the fact that I'm working with you shows that I believe in you. You know, like I believe in myself. I want you to succeed, just like I want me to succeed. Um, whether it's time, money any other type of resource, um, the desire to work with people means something. Uh, and I, I think that uh, some people may take that that little part for granted, while others understand the value of that. Do you think that's like a lost skill set as far as like, because it's very hard, to, so, so like, it, I don't want to say it's very hard, um, but like I don't see a lot of people who again like I said do the process conversations do the like informal mentoring that will do that will take the steps that you have so like again do you think it's something that like and I know this is like a self-serving question on your part but again like what makes you different because it's something that you can like pinpoint um what makes me different I, I don't know I, I don't even know how to answer that question I don't mm-hmm. really know what makes me different from anybody else who is uh, either curating professionally or doing the same thing I'm doing, is just reaching out to people and saying, hey, look, I'd like to work. Um, I think that for me, the reason why I choose to do that is because I want to provide the support that I wanted. Yeah. And get that support. I guess somebody offered me a show like that. I didn't have that coming up as a, an up and coming artist. So, um, you know, the, the first time that I had a solo show, it was because I, I was a, I was actually a member of a gallery at the time, and uh, these these guys were all my age. Mm-hmm. Or they're my peers, right? <clears throat> and uh, we were meeting, and it became a requirement for us as resident artists in the gallery to have a solo show. If we're going to be residents, we have to be actively making work and so on and so forth, right? So, um, with that situation, I had my show. Mm. I curated my own show. Okay. I hung my own show. Um, but that doesn't mean that I didn't want somebody there with me to go through that process. That doesn't mean I didn't want somebody to teach me how to properly do it. Save you from some headaches? Yeah, I did have some headaches. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, man, like, and, and when I say the support that I didn't have, it's not the support of my peers per se, it's the support from people who have been doing it for a while, right? It was great that my friends had this gallery going and I was a part of it from the beginning and everything. That's a wonderful situation. Not everybody's going to have that. Very few people are going to have that. Mm-hmm. And as somebody who's kind of come along a little bit, I want to be able to provide that help that I feel like maybe I should have been getting early in the game from the OGs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were no OGs out with me out at that point. Matter of fact, not many of them knew who I was. So um, I'm purposely looking at artists. Like when I go to an event and I see artwork on display and, you know, it's not somebody I know, I go and I talk to that person. They don't know that I'm checking them out for something. But it's crazy that you get to that point where, like, you're, the, you're becoming the OG at this point. Yeah, kind of, sort of. Yeah. Kind of, sort of. You know, I'm not famous by any means. Yeah. I'm not rich. Uh-huh. But... Um, you know, I had some experiences that I'd like to share with people and I, I want to, you know, share some of those lessons. And as I continue to move ahead in my art career, I think it's important that I keep doing that. You mm-hmm. know, I'm, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm OG status yet. I'm, I'm not even, not even close to that. You know, there's some people who are living off of their work, who yeah. are doing very well for themselves. When I get to that point, then I'll accept that <laughs> OG title, but uh, I'm not there yet. Mm-hmm. All right, so I'm always inspired by team success and building a collective, mm-hmm. right? So 
I recently read, um, and I, I kind of put me onto it too. I recently read like the Wu Tang Manual, and again, mm-hmm. it's, it, again, it's a book about like just process and like how just inspiration and mentorship and so on and so forth. Just, just how they got to like create something that solid that, that mm-hmm. like made a lot of people famous and like made a lot of people like set for the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. So, um, talk to me about Procreate. Procreate Artist Group. Okay. So, first and foremost, I want everybody to know I am not the founder of the <laughs> artist group, okay? Exclusive. Um, I may be the guy who talks it up a lot. Um, I may be the guy in the group who has been around for a long time. However, I am a founding member, okay? Shayla Mora Hardy is mm-hmm. the founder of Procreate Artist Group. And the way that that started is uh, I met her when I was working at Jerry's Art Around. So I was in the art store, and uh, I was probably on the job for a week or two, right? I meet Lamora, and uh, you know she introduces herself to me. She's a customer, and she's buying something or whatever. She talks about her art. And I'm like, yeah, cool. All right, nice to meet you. <laughs> Great. I sold some stuff, right? Six months later, she comes in. Uh, now, I hadn't seen her in long time but I recognize her face so you know of course it's small talk hey I haven't seen you in a while and then she says um so you're you you show your work and stuff right I'm like yeah I do a little bit you know, by that time I probably did like maybe one or two shows <laughs> so <laughs> uh, yeah yeah so, <laughs> so she asked me to be a part of this show called Procreate Okay, so Procreate Artist Group started as an art show first. Then um, we did the show. It was about 10 people on the show. It was a big success. That was the first time I ever had two events in one month. Mm -hmm. I was doing another show in that same month um, with my coworkers at the art supply store. So, uh, you know, fast forward maybe another six or seven months, we kept in touch. And we wanted to do another show because the first one was a hit. People loved it. There was a lot of people there. It was mad cool, right? So we decide, okay, we're going to do another show called uh, Unity. And in that Unity show, we wanted to take non-artists or people who were not a part of the arts community Mm -hmm. and do a piece with them. Okay. What do you mean not a part of the arts community? So people who just don't make art. People who aren't familiar with what we do. Oh, so you want to just like land them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's dope. Random people in our circle. That's or, dope. Or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it's a cool story about this. I actually used my <laughs> nephew. Uh-huh. My nephew was the, the person who I chose, and uh, we worked on a piece together. And I had him do the background. I surprised him by putting a portrait on that piece that we worked on together. And I actually gave him the painting oh, at the end of the show. I now use that piece for my business card. Mm. Um, anyway, going back to Procreate, uh, we did that show. It was a hit. And so me, Lamora, and her cousin, Niche, who has been along, mm-hmm. she's been around for the whole thing. Actually, she's been around longer than I have because mm-hmm. her and Niche were sitting together doing art together and all that stuff since before Procreate was even an idea. Yeah. So. Um, her, Nish, and myself, we got together and uh, we started talking about making a group. And then that conversation then spilled over into the rest of the people that were involved in the show. And so, needless to say, there was a Procreate Artist Group. <laughs> um, so, uh, it's been quite a journey uh, since Procreate has been founded. Uh, we've been around since 2009, and uh, you know, honestly, we they're like family to me. Uh, we have we took a hiatus and we came back after two years and it's like we never stopped. So now we, we, uh, we've done uh, Art Music Motion, which was the event that we did in March at Art Space uh, involving live painting and uh, some uh, live music and we had kids painting with us and stuff. It was real cool. Um, and we're doing other shows as well. Keith Clater happens to be a part of Procreate, um, which is why we did the show uh, a couple weeks ago at, uh, at his studio. Yeah. So what we're doing now is we're taking members from the group and we're doing art shows uh, on a smaller scale. So is, it, is everyone responsible for the, the, the how does that? How do you keep the collective like strong? So everybody's doing their own events and then you support? Or? Doing events and supporting, we meet monthly. Mm-hmm. 
Um, you have to meet. Uh, you have to see each other face to face. You need that time with each other in order to be a group, in order to be, you know, in order to have that bond, right? So uh, we meet monthly. We support each other's events. Um, I actually just did an event not too long ago uh, where Niche was uh, was a performer at, <laughs> at the event. This was the uh, Unframed show. Oh, yeah. Okay. The big backdrop, or whatever, yeah. right? So, so Niche is in the music as well as visual arts. And so she she performed a song at that event as well. And, um, you know, all of us kind of have our own thing going, but we all try to tie something into the appropriate artist group. And as of now, like, you and Keith's work are still, like, in 224, right? As of the tape. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so right now uh, at, at the 224, uh, 224 Farmington Avenue, uh, me and uh, about seven other artists mm -hmm. uh, have work on display. Uh, Keith has a solo display actually in a small gallery of his uh, photography cool. work. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's up until uh, the until the seventeenth of this month, and then uh, I get my babies back. <laughs> I got three pieces in there. That, uh, you know, it's nice to have them on display, but sometimes you just don't want to let go. Mm, I get you. <laughs> um, what does being in a collective do for your art? Being in a collective actually helps you to develop your art. Um, it's just like having art class, right? Uh, when you're in college, you, you go to these classes and you're working with up to 20 other artists in the room, right? You are all painting the same thing or drawing the same thing, but not one picture in the room looks alike. Not one. Mm -hmm. So that means you have 20 or so different perspectives on the one, on subject. one subject, okay? So you take that and you put that in a collective of artists. It may not be one subject, however, everybody has a different view of the world, a view of art in general, and you learn from whatever their perspective is. You learn from their experiences and you feed off of one another. Uh, Procreate actually has sessions where we just go and we create together. We just make stuff. Okay. And we all critique one another. And, and uh, you know, That was, was my next question. It was very helpful. Uh -huh. It was very helpful. In the beginning, we used to do that a lot. Um, and I found myself being able to develop a lot quicker. Uh, just artistically and creatively and I found myself experimenting with some things too so we have uh, mixed media artists in the group mm. uh, as well as a photographer as well as you know a traditional painter um, and then you have my work and, and uh, we we all bring something different to the table creatively and so you're able to, to kind of explore different things and see how other people do what they do and that's the coolest thing to me about an appropriate show mm -hmm. um, so again like, like when, when it, it's just going into the room and seeing like everybody so like when doing our, our space I, I forgot the name it was hard it was art music art music motion like, so it's just go in that room and just see like again everybody's like, just all the different personalities in appropriate like just see their stuff like one see all their stuff like displayed but two like just to to see um, you doing your live pieces and so on and so forth, and like um, and it's also like so. So from the beginning to end, like you guys interacting with the kids, you're making this show like accessible from like, for whether you're like five years old or like seventy eight. Yeah. Like it was like a really cool experience. You get. like one, the opening was the opening was really like was dope, but it was also your stuff hung there for a while. Mm -hmm. So I think that was like, like it, it's just amazing to see like all that happen, and I like, just see how everybody gets their shine. Um, and how different everybody's art, how different and how dope all everybody's pieces are, like just in their own in their own merit. And that's what makes a good art show. You know, not everything needs to look like everybody else's work. You all have to be able to stand on your own as well as mesh well with mm -hmm. the rest of the work. And I think we're we're able to achieve that. Um, you know, just by curating it that way um, we sometimes we stagger our pieces maybe we'll, we'll put we'll put one person's work next to the others and sometimes we'll split it up into groups on different walls and stuff so um, it, it, it um it all kind of works together and that, that comes with experience over time you know we we all have been showing with each other for a while right? mm -hmm. so we kind of know how our work works with each other yeah so we'll put ourselves next to certain artists because we just know <laughs> my stuff is a little it works well right, right next to this person you, right here right, right and vice versa all right so um i only got two more okay. um so in a hartford current article mm -hmm. in 2014 uh-huh um, you were quoted by saying, "I've done the starving. I've done the starving artist thing. It's not fun. It's a fantasy." 
Um, obviously, we already went over it. The goal is to like to be sustainable, mm-hmm. and um, it's to be sustainable and is like just just and to thrive off your art. Um, where are you with that? So l- let me uh, let me first start by saying I stand by that quote because mm-hmm. it is a fantasy. Yeah. Um, in this day and age, there's no reason why you should be a starving artist. We're not in the days of Van Gogh, right? There's a lot of ways to advertise yourself. There's a lot of ways to make money. Um, there are a lot of different avenues that you can take to to get yourself ahead, right? Uh, whether it's having a day job or just promoting the hell out of yourself on the internet. People do it. People make it. There's a lot more artists who are making money and thriving right now in this day and age than there were back then. Mm-hmm. Okay, So the the whole idea of the starving artist is a cliche and it's a stereotype. And I think that it is my job and every other artist's job who's in this century <laughs> to kind of uh, get rid of that stereotype because it really shouldn't exist. Um, There are artists who are doctors and lawyers. There are artists who are machinists. There are artists who are working in retail. The fact of the matter is they're all able to make money and do what they need to do in order to make art. But um, getting back to to your question (laughs) about um, where I am in that journey, um, I'd like to say that I'm at a point where my art does sell. Um, I have work that I need to do for a client after we uh, finish this interview. So, uh, commissions come in. (laughs) Uh, I would like them to come in a little more frequently than they are. However, I'm not complaining because I'm still able to do the artwork that I love to do and not the artwork that I have to do. Stuff that you have to do is not necessarily your idea. It It ain't coming from you. So, you have less of an attachment to it. But... The fact that this person in particular is giving me a creative license oh, that's dope. means I can do whatever I want. Yeah. So you know, I'm not really complaining about this guy. He's a great person. He's actually he's purchased work from me before. Um. So, uh, what what I what I think I am as far as uh, my journey is concerned, I'm at a point where I know what it's like to sell your work. I know how it feels, but I haven't necessarily identified a certain set of people who are my client. And that is the hump that I need to get over. I don't know who my client specifically is. I just know a lot of different people purchase my work. Um, I've had educators. I've had other artists purchase my work. I've had people who are engineers purchase my work, right? White people, black people, Spanish people. Uh, it, it really you know, it's just like it's everywhere. It's just it, it's kind Hopefully. of all over the place. I haven't I haven't identified a specific niche for my client base, mm-hmm. um, and that's been a challenge for me uh, for the last couple of years. And so that's why I'm still working a day job uh, because at, although the art sells, it doesn't sell frequently enough because. I don't know who the steady client is. I need those collectors, so that's where I'm at right now. I need to uh, I need to find a couple collectors, mm-hmm. and um, you know I'm also working with the uh, arts advocacy stuff. So getting into that, I may actually be able to create something for myself to do. Okay. As a job, so you never know where things can lead you. You know, this may be a, another way for me to make money, and uh, you know, who knows? Who knows? Five years from now, I may still be working at my current job, but I may also be selling a lot more art. You never know. Mm-hmm. Um, five years from now, I may have quit my job, and I may have that twenty thousand dollar piece that I'm working on for some rich guy in New York who just likes pretty colors. I, I don't know. <laughs> But uh, what I do know is I won't stop making art. You know, it doesn't matter to me where I am in life. Um, I'm always going to make art, and that's just what it is. So I'm cheating because my final question is a two-parter. Okay. <laughs> um, one, what do you tell your seven-year-old self mm-hmm. about just trusting the journey? And two... Just to anybody, it's not necessarily like a second question, mm. but just to anybody else out there who's like in the grind, like just trying to figure out where they, where just how to get where they want to get in this art thing. Like just, it could be the same piece of advice, but again, just like what do you tell 
those so, two bases. What I would tell my seven year old self about the art journey, I'll put my DJ Khaled hat on. They don't they want you. They, do. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want you to succeed. They don't want you to prosper. They don't want you to make art, and they certainly don't want you to do something better than them. But they can't stop you. Plain and simple. Stay away from them. They can't stop you. Nobody can stop you from pursuing your dream but you. And it's your decision to stop that pursuit. Right? I would tell that to my seven-year-old self. I would tell that to anybody else that's out here trying to pursue any type of dream for that matter. Nobody can stop you from doing it. Only you can. And it's up to you to find the right route to take. Um, there are a number of different things that you can do to get where you want to be. Don't just focus on one path because in life, you're going to sway a little bit. It just happens that way. That's how life works. You're not going to go down this straight and narrow path to that one particular point that you think you're supposed to be at. Okay? What's going to happen is it's going to be a bumpy road. There will be obstacles. There will be lessons learned. And don't be overwhelmed by the obstacles that you face because the real value is not in reaching the goal. It's the journey to achieving it. That's where the value is. When you reach your goal, when you've achieved that objective, okay. it's done. You finished. Then what? So value the journey. Cherish the journey. That's what it's all about message <laughs> and with that um, thank you for hosting us um, no problem anything you want to say be a thing um, uh, yeah uh, visit www.andrerochester.com if you want to learn more about me if uh, you want to see my bio, my bio page see my portfolio see upcoming events etc etc uh, also uh, you can go to procreateart.com um, yeah, you can find out more about Appropriate Artist Group uh, and just uh, look out for more community stuff it's, it's coming your way you're going to see artists are going to be doing some great things over the next couple years and uh, you know it's not in spite of what may be missing right now as far as uh, government support certainly not in spite of it's because we need to plain and simple artists need to support other artists and we need to learn how to lift each other up um, so that when those funds do become available and there will be, be a time when those funds are available, we're not only at a point where we're prepared to do something with that funding, but we're also able to build partnerships and working relationships with people in certain positions that we may not have seen ourselves with before. So uh, yeah, that's, that's all I got to say, man. I, I know this can go on forever, but like, I'm going to let you do your, your, your commission piece. Uh, I'm not going to stay in your way at all. Um, but again, see, I do be listening. Um, shout out to Andre Rochester. Shout out to Kyle, who's like always working on the stuff like behind the scenes. Um, no apologies, productions, and we're out. <laughs>